In a saga steeped in intrigue and ambition, Henry VIII orchestrated a seismic shift in history to wed Anne Boleyn, reshaping the very fabric of religious authority to dissolve his union with Catherine of Aragon. His fervor was unmatched, driven not only by desire, but by an unyielding thirst for a male heir. With his dynastic aspiration unmet, Henry's gaze turned once more in search of progeny. Yet, in a stunning twist of fate, Anne Boleyn's story took a harrowing turn. Instead of a graceful exit akin to Catherine's, she met a fate wrought with treason and execution. The echoes of Henry's reign and the tumult of Anne Boleyn's marriage still reverberate through the annals of time. It's whispered that her spirit lingers among us. One chilling account dating back to 1864 speaks of a vigilant guard encountering the spectral figure of the former queen clad in ethereal white. Startled, he lunged with his bayonet only to find his weapon passing through her ephemeral form. But it's during the Yuletide season, Anne's favorite time of year, that sightings peak. She is said to wander the grounds, revisiting cherished moments beneath the ancient oak or strolling along the banks of Eden Lake, where fleeting memories of joy and love once bloomed. These spectral apparitions offer a glimpse into a past steeped in passion and intrigue, where the boundaries between the living and the dead blur with haunting allure. There you go. That's a famous ghost story many people are aware of. Is it a real ghost? I mean, what, what, what are we talking <laughs> are we, about here? Like, just, look, let's get right into it. The, the, the Haunted solved. Cosmos guys are here. We are the Ghostbusters yeah. of Reformed Christendom. Yeah, that's for sure a ghost. No, I mean, so we're going to talk about what actually is a ghost. We're not going to sit here for 45 minutes and tell you guys there's no such thing as ghosts, but we're going to talk about- Would never what, do that. What is a ghost? Mm -hmm. Um because the problem, we're always going to be coming from a biblical perspective because we want to talk about what's true and we want to honor Christ. Yeah. And so uh, we're not sitting here saying there is no such thing as a ghost, um, but they should be understood in proper yeah. categories. Yeah. And if you think that um, Anne Boleyn, um, that it's actually her spirit and that, uh, that she was able to raise from Sheol and just God giving her some license and walking around cash, you know, around Christmas time each year. <laughs> and walking around. You know, <laughs> that she just gets to go and visit the park and feed the ducks, you know, and yeah. that she doesn't have to remain. I, I just don't know how to square that with scripture. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of it actually being, this is her, her spirit. Mm -hmm. um, I, that, that is difficult. But in terms of this is something and that yeah. it is spiritual, that we can talk about. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's probably, in, in this kind of topic, what my what it's at least helpful for me, I think, would be to talk through each of the possibilities, some of the theories, okay, and and let's just look at them from a biblical perspective, right? And see, one of the first ones that comes to mind for me, Joel, and it might not be the same one for you, Ben. I I don't know, but uh, you hear this a lot, a kind of stone tape theory, mm. which is a theory that. Um, it's, we'll get to the disembodied spirit kind of theory. It's Brian's favorite. It's my favorite theory. Favorite theory. <laughs> because it, it's one of the theories oh, like that I've heard Christians try to hold to in a way to circumvent that problem that we'll talk about of the spirit of a human being wandering around outside of Sheol or outside of, you know, at this point, it was the spirits of saints going to be with the Lord, mm -hmm. right? So... Uh, the stone tape theory is the idea that human beings uh, impart a kind of psychic energy. Again, I'm not endorsing any of this yet. This is right. the theory. You're just you, laying out the theory. Yeah. Yeah. And then later you'll say 100%. It's 100 <laughs> demons. We always lay it. Haunted Cosmos, the joke is, there is a, the, the Haunted Cosmos team has investigated the issue and determined it was demons. Right. So, <laughs> but to be fair, because some people don't like that. Um, a lot of stuff is demons, well, but that's actually not because I've listened to enough of you guys. That's actually not. We don't your always. Yeah, we don't always. No. Yeah, because, because we also say fairies a lot. Yeah, we say fairies. Well, exactly. <laughs> and we're going to do a whole episode on on fairies because yeah. there, it, it, it could be demons, but it, um, mm -hmm. the, it could be fairies. It could be uh, uh, witches. Uh, yeah. and and getting into elemental spirits and what is that? Is that yeah, actually right. kind of, you know different there, classes there are of different spiritual things. beings? Yeah. So stone tape theory is that human beings and in some iterations of the theory. Even animals, 
certain higher animals have psychic energy that they impart on the environment around them. And so this gets into lots of other issues like mediumship, where mediums will claim to see your aura, which is just your psychic energy emanating out of you, your, your, your immaterial self and material self and you know blended together emanating energy. And that when there are particularly intense psychic energies, that these can actually leave a residue on the environment. Hmm. So hence the stone tape theory, similar to how a vinyl record is made. Right. Scratches. You have, you know, yeah. scratches in a vinyl, right. first in a wax blank or in a softer material that this needle is imparting the sound waves into the vinyl. And then you put another, you know, reader in that groove and it can play it back. So under certain conditions, they, they, those will replay, it, it, you know, in a case like Anne Boleyn and in, uh, you know, divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived. We've got a lot of death surrounding the royal family at this time, um, just in general, in old places, in Civil War battlefields, right. in places that saw a lot of death or grief or the loss of children or, you know, the, the, the czar and his family. This is all over the place. And this tends to be the kind of haunting, quote unquote, that just replays the same kind of scene over and over. You look up in a window on a certain night of the year and you'll see the woman dressed in Victorian garb. Right. Or if you go out into the castle hallway at this time of night, you just might see. Right. And so this theory attempts to get around the idea that this is actually the soul of that person. Gotcha. And instead just says, this is the residue. This is the replaying tape. It's, wor it's the world's memory. In yeah, a way. exactly. Exactly. It's less the person and their spirit, which is somewhere else. And it's more the world itself. Yeah. With that, I can't, I couldn't help but think, and this is probably a stupid question, which I, I'm, it's one of my giftings uh, to ask stupid questions, but. Um, <laughs> hey, but Joel, there's no such there's thing. There's no such thing. <laughs> stupid. That's not unless true. we unless determine I've, it was. I've said that before, and then I've, I've read some YouTube comments. And yeah, like, oh, and you're like, there actually are Unless you ask stupid a stupid questions. question, there's right. no such thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but this would be, I could see someone, not me, I, I wouldn't do this. I could see someone asking for a friend uh, who would say, well, are certain people, places in certain parts of the world, uh, perhaps more porous, right? Yeah. That something is mm -hmm. like more akin to a diamond. It's, it's going to be hard to mm. scratch, yep. but maybe particular uh, places you could get a deeper groove. People you know do I mean? as like, associate geological uh, characteristics of an area. There are, there are whole, I mean, the thing about more the ghost porous. world is that because it's not truly, it's almost none of it is truly empirical. It's not replicable. You can't put it in a test tube. Right. People can just come up with theories that sound plausible. So they might say things like, well, where you have more limestone in the ground, this right. is, we, we see a highly correlative. Well, that's pretty much what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but, but with that, my point is, but if that was a factor and however you word it, the point is um, that it would be, it would be a couple factors and not just one. It would be uh, the nature of the event. What happened? Was it yeah. traumatic? Was it treacherous? Was it this? Was it that? Joyful. But then not just what happened. Uh, but also the place mm -hmm. where it happened. It mm -hmm. happened in this particular place where or it happened in a lake and water has memory. You well, know, yeah, yeah, what, absolutely. You know, like, That's traumatic things happen it. everywhere yeah. and really good things also happen everywhere. But I, I, I don't think the idea of a thin place is outside the realm of possibility at all. I think that there might be geographic areas that lend itself uh, or that lend themselves much more to um, whatever this is. Yeah, <laughs> whether and, it's stone tape or something else. Right. In the thin place, a lot of time people are actually in, in that kind of iteration of this theory, which encompasses ghosts and a lot of other activity. That is truly beyond a stone tape theory now and into more of a, there are places where the realms cross over yeah. more thinly. But so what about uh, examples in scripture, Bethel would be one, mm -hmm. Mount Hermon would be one, Mount Zion would be yeah, one. This truly is the house of God. Mount Sinai would Jacob be one. Says. These high places. Yeah. Do you think that that is a thin place or do you think that they're arbitrary, not arbitrary in the sense that God just picked randomly, but mm -hmm. arbitrary in our mind mm -hmm. of, of uh, the mechanics of how these places work? Or do you think that they, in their nature somehow, lend themselves mm -hmm. more to spiritual encounters? In So in... This, this is now crossing over into other types of phenomena as well. I do think that bringing some of these together, stone tape type, type of psychic energy theory, along with the place mattering, 
I think that we can tend to too quickly as modern Christians not understand how much our thinking has been shaped by modernism and materialism and too quickly totally dismiss anything and be like, no, people are just... There's no such thing as psychic energy. And, I, and I'm not saying that, you know, we should be going to mediums or auras or things like that. I think there's a lot of deception. We'll get, we'll get to it, yeah. certainly, in this episode. But I do think that once you start to understand the way that God made the world and people, you start to, you, you start to realize that, you know, we don't know everything and we are much more complex things than we understand. You know, things like... I often even consider the the fact that placebo medicines really do affect the health of a person. People can have a real serious illness or condition and they'll go on a trial of medication and one right. group gets sugar pills and one right. group gets the real thing. And the sugar pill group, some of them will genuinely, because they believe that they're receiving a medication, this new thing, you know, they will improve. Right. Just and, by the mere thinking, and we're not of that. even saying that that's like, oh, and so therefore, like, therefore, psychic man, energy, and no. or, or we're not <laughs> no, seeing the no. power of positivity or manifesting. No, uh -uh. But but there is something to be said. Like um, if if somebody's struggling with heartburn and you give them a pill and they think it's real and they're convinced that heartburn will no longer be a, a problem, and then they actually report that heartburn has been less severe. Well, uh, that's not the power of positivity. That could be a number of things. One could be well, one thing that induces heartburn is stress. Mm -hmm. And they have now a sense of security and peace yeah, yeah. that they've been offered a solution. Yeah. So therefore they're less stressed. So therefore they have less heartburn. And none of that is necessarily magical. It, That's it's cortisol. Yeah, and right. even even the you know, things like a lot of, you know, take grounding or earthing where people have are starting to get into studies of like what happens when you um, you know, attach your body directly to the earth. And there's an earth circuit. We're electrical machines, like you just, our body. Like, like walking barefoot. On, yeah, on, on the ground, dirt. in negative ions from the earth. You know, there's all this, and it will, there are studies that show that it seems that this, this kind of thing reduces inflammation in the body and a lot of other positive mm -hmm. effects. Where modernism, we've kind of reduced ourselves to this hermetically sealed off from the world bag of flesh, bag of atoms, and that mm -hmm. it's silly to start thinking. Right. Of, just because a whole lot of the world that of paganism and esoterica and things, they make radical grandiose claims and they're so woo woo that we sometimes can fall in the other ditch yes. and fail to realize we are wonderfully made. Right. We are these insanely fine tuned electrical machine, electrical magnetic physical yeah. machines that also happen to have a soul. Mag magically made. We are, yeah. and, and the world is magic. I mean, it really is magic. Yeah. Yeah. So, all, that we came from dust is, is literal magic. Ultimately, yeah. on the stone tape theory, I reject it formally as an explanation of, of what we call hauntings. But, but with that, real, real quick, because this question was burning yeah. in my head mm -hmm. also, in terms of like attaching yourself to the earth in certain places. And like, mm -hmm. so then that got me just thinking like tethering um, in terms of uh, what, what about like what, one added element with this, the, the, the stone tape, um, like Samson and his hair, or so, what about like talisman? Mm, like a talisman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't, I is don't a, like the idea of talismans apart from a, uh, a deus ex machina type right. idea where the Lord has sovereignly said, your strength is in your hair. Yeah. Right. Just, just because, or the Urim, the Umim and the Thumim. Right. It's, the Urim all, and the Thumim. it's not, just man those. can't do that. Right. Man but can't. God determines. However, what's interesting, this is actually really fascinating. It goes back to something that you were saying about a lot of the new age esoterica people that seem to be noticing things mm -hmm. in the world that are actually there. Like the fact that, uh, mandalas can help restructure a glass of water. Maybe. Just maybe. potentially. Yeah. And 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 Christians are prone to see that and think that's witchcraft. Mm. I cannot do that. And that's not witchcraft. That no. could just be noticing something in nature that God's given us. Boving says this in Christianity and Science. He says that man is connected to the world that he was that, that he's in with every fiber of his being. And then later he says that everything that we see in the world is pointing us towards something unseen. Mm -hmm. Everything that you see is pointing you towards something unseen. And, the, and to think, to have the reaction of, well, Christians can't do that because the new ager discovered it, mm. is peak modernist cope. Mm. Because what you're effectively saying is that we've discovered everything that there is to discover. Right. That Christians are done. 
Mm. And that's completely antithetical to the whole gospel. Right. Christians yeah. are just getting started. Are you a beef jerky enthusiast? Well, then stop it. Seriously, stop it. Because biltong is superior to beef jerky in every single way. It's a traditional South African meat snack, but it's free from all the preservatives, the sugar, and the soy. It's like the Wagyu of jerky. Now, here's the exciting news from Farmer Bill's provisions. Farmer Bill's is introducing their brand new product line for your enjoyment. We've got right here the traditional beef slab. You've also got, if you want a smaller portion, you've got the slices. It's just as much meat, but you're able to eat it in increments. This is for yourself as an individual, or maybe for you and your family, your kids. Then you've got the meat sticks. This is what, if you're a working man, you want a snack to keep in your pocket to eat you know, before lunch or something like that, grab one of their beef sticks and take it on the go. Lastly, you got to check out the tallow. For all the moms out there, my wife, she swears by this. Many women in our church say that it's a fantastic product. So don't waste any more time. Go to farmerbillsprovisions.com today to support a Christian-owned small business. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe so that you can save on multiple options and ensure that you and your family will never be without your favorites. And the last thing is this. If you want to get 15% off your purchase, all you got to do is type in the promo code right response. Again, the promo code type in right response. So visit farmerbillsprovisions.com today and get 15% off your purchase. Right Response Ministries 2025 conference is a go. This is three days, full jam-packed conference with eight main sessions, three to four hour and a half long panels, and an all-star super based lineup of speakers, 15 speakers in all. Who are they? Steve Dace, Jeff Durbin, Orrin McIntyre, Stephen Wolf, Brian Sauvey, Andrew Isker, John Harris, Eric Kahn, A.D. Robles, Dan Burkholder, the Christian Prince himself. Dusty Devers, Ben Garrett, Zachary Garris, David Reese, and yours truly, Pastor Joel Webbin. Again, this is April 3rd, 4th, and 5th, 2025, and the early registration is open right now. This is the longest conference with the most speakers we've ever offered, and yet it is our all-time lowest price. The early registration available today is only 140 bucks for an adult. So go to rightresponseconference.com. Again, that is rightresponseconference.com to register right now because the early registration will not last long. Right. So there's, you know, as far as talismans go, where I was actually going with that, <laughs> is mm, that yeah. the medievals actually thought quite highly of charms and talismans. They would do this thing called a witch cake, which sounds really bad. Uh, and it probably was foolish, but <laughs> it sounds bad. It probably also was bad, <coughs> right? But, but what, what they <laughs> anyway. do is, if they uh, felt that their crop yield was was bewitched, not by someone else, but just by nature, or if they felt that you know they were sick and and they were bewitched in their sickness, or there was an unclean spirit in them, or something like that, they would bake a witch cake, which included the mixing of flour that was old with urine, uh, which is really gross, and then some honey and, and some other stuff. And they would feed it to their dog. And if the dog ate it and kept it down, then it worked. And, and the curse would go away. If the dog spat <laughs> it up, it didn't work. And they actually weren't cursed. It was just, they're just having a bad day. Um, but they did this all the time. They, they, they did this with their, uh, with their crop yield. They would sprinkle charms around their plants. They would sing charms uh, in the form of verse over their bees to make them obey mm. the beekeepers, things like this. And I'm not saying they were right to do that. In fact, I don't think they, they were, were not to right that. to do that. They were not. Yeah. <clears throat> but the point is, is that the reason they did that is because there were other people doing that that seemed, and it seemed to work. Right. And so they were trying to redeem the times that they were in by saying, no, 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 that's the Christians now. That's the, again, I don't think they were right to do yeah. that, but you, you can't have so much arrogance that you look back at those people who were trying to make the best of the times that God placed them in and say, they were basically pagans. Right. They didn't actually believe in the gospel because they tried to do that. That's so foolish of you. Mm. They would probably think the same about you if given the opportunity because you watch Netflix and you watch well, pornography on Game of Thrones. Our errors aren't mm. their errors. So they would be able to see errors of yeah. ours that I do think we can look 
the fundamental talismans is a great point actually about this and, and the witch cakes and things like that, that human beings are <clears throat> tremendously prone to deception of, and superstitious deception is one of the greatest ways to, to trick a person. So a lot of what I think is fundamentally operative when you're looking at things like talismans and hauntings that are, you know, hauntings or poltergeist activity or things that are related to a, an object. There's the classic story of my, my brother returned from a tour in the Middle East and he brought home this, you know, jewelry box. And when he, in his, all of a sudden he got sick every time and there was darkness and depression. And then he realized that he needed to get rid of the box and he threw it away. So when he returned home, it was yeah, sitting on his yeah. bed. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think that that necessarily isn't true, mm -hmm. but I think what is happening is important. And it's the reality that unclean spirits are ancient, malevolent, highly intelligent, and know how to trick people. And there are many. So right. they the will Middle make East. your superstitions come true. Right. They yeah. will. So they might make the witch cake work. Mm. They might make the object seem haunted. Right. This is the thing that, this is why we come back to demons so often, right. is because demons are a Swiss army knife in the sense that they're an intelligence. Right. They can give, they can show you what you want and they can make your idea right. prove out. And, and real quick, just a little demonology, because you know we, we talked about this in other episodes, but in case they, you know, the order of the episodes comes out differently and they haven't heard that yet, um, I, I like what you said, they're ancient. Mm -hmm. and, and part of what that includes is um, that they're skilled, they're knowledgeable, yeah. they're a formidable opponent. Sometimes Christians can be naive and arrogant mm -hmm. and thinking, you know, I'm going to go and, you know, like I've, I mean, especially, you know, I, I came from the charismatic world and there were some, this doesn't, you know, characterize everybody, but there were some, you know, cases of people literally uh, doing, you know, like a seven day fast and, and locking themselves, you know, collectively a group of, of people in a, in, in a, a building or a room and that we're going to pray and we're going to ask for the demonic spirits over this region to reveal themselves and tell us their names so that we can uh, cast them out. And that reminds me of a little story, you know, the seven sons of Sceva, mm -hmm. yes. where they get their butts kicked. They do essentially the same thing. We're gonna go and beat up the demons because Jesus did it and Paul did it. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're gonna do it too. And they go to beat up the demons, and say, except in this scenario, it's seven V one, you know, mm -hmm. the, and, right. uh, and the result is that the seven, and I'll just, you know, for the listener, you can use your imagination, but the Bible says that they leave, they leave naked and bleeding. Yeah. Which, however that plays out, just doesn't sound... Nothing like, When I think of combinations that I do not want to experience... Nothing good. Naked, naked and bleeding. And bleeding nothing good. Not, that's Joel, not a, a good combo. Remind me when we get to our witches episode. I'm just going to tease it right now, guys. Remind me to talk about Jeremy Wade and the fishing show. River Monsters. River Monsters okay. with the witch episode. One of the best Because there's a rabbit trail I want to go down now, but it's a witch episode rabbit trail. Okay. Nice. Incredible self-control. But getting, <laughs> getting back, okay, getting Way back to, to our- That's impressive. To our ghosts. Okay. We've got stone tape. I don't think stone tape is necessarily true. In fact, I don't think it is. However, I do think that the spiritual realm will attempt via superstition to deceive and show you what you want. So I think you will see the possibility of stone tape type hauntings yeah. at exact places where human beings would expect them as a way of deceiving people. So, so in, in, from the perspective of man, for all intents and purposes, you can say stone tape theory might be possible. The problem is that it's not technically by definition of stone tape theory as it's known. Mm -hmm. It's that the demons are manipulating your superstitions. Yeah. Right. Now I have yeah. two okay. primary okay. theories behind all hauntings. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to account for the ones that are the, the vast majority, which are very negative experiences. And also some of the ones that I've heard from patrons of the show mm. that I'm like, I have no way of conceptualizing why that would happen because it seems overwhelmingly positive. And for the show, just for the listener, um, check out this series. It's coming out. If you want to binge and get every single episode, become a Patreon supporter and, and you can actually have access, access ad-free and watch every episode. But also... Uh, go on over, watch us, but also watch Haunted Cosmos. And uh, so go on YouTube, Joel, subscribe, you. Haunted Cosmos. They already have dozens of episodes available. Yep. And if you join their Patreon, you can get like, like 40, 50 more episodes. Yeah. I think a 70. Second show, yeah. A second show called The Dusty Tome. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so if you like this, you need to also check did, them out. We did, I think it was close to a two hour episode 
on ghosts. On, on hauntings as well. And we went through all the different types of hauntings, the residual, yeah. the the, uh, the crisis separation. Yeah, the, the crisis haunted separation, object, the haunted house. The concept of a ghost as the disembodied spirit of a loved one yep. or yeah. of a person in general. So. so I have two right now working ideas that mm -hmm. I've been tossing around on how, to, uh, how I would conceptualize of these things. And the first is really basic. And it's that the, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim mm -hmm. are oftentimes characterized through mythology as tricksters. Mm -hmm. Yes, And a trickster varies in degrees of malice. Sometimes it's just uh, like, like a bell witch type thing. You can go listen to our show and, and hear about the bell witch, <laughs> which actually is not a witch. It's a It's, a it's a, like a poltergeist. So it's kind of haunting. a confusing title there, but uh, a poltergeist type phenomenon right. where stuff's moved around in the house and maybe it never gets worse than that. It's like Winston, right? It's a prank yeah. is too small or it's too big. It's right. like, yeah, I, exactly. I rearranged your cups. Ooh. Or yeah. I took and the salt out of your salt shaker and, and the pepper it, out of your pepper right. and switched, switched them, them. Yeah. so that when you went to salt your fries, you peppered <laughs> yeah. them. Oh my goodness. Oh. But then on You'll the flip never side, yeah. it, might never be the prank it might be is, very bad. Uh, that yeah. I dropped an anvil on your head while you were sleeping. Right. And crushed yeah. it. Oh, the prank is that yeah. blood's pouring out of your walls <laughs> right. and you're- And I poisoned you and you died. And, and you your died. son yeah. is stuck in a cave. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so varying too degrees small, of malice. Too small, too big. Right. They never really get right in the middle where it's actually funny. But- uh but that seems to be characteristic of a trickster type entity through all mythology and history yeah. is that m maybe it's trial and error, although that sounds dumb because of their ancient nature. I, but yeah, like I, I like to think of a, of a demonic entity, in, especially as the disembodied spirit of a Nephilim as a Gandalf type character, but bad. Mm. Where they came to the world long ago, right. they've lived 300 lives of men. Or Three hundred lives of men I've walked, and this now earth. I have no, no time. I have no time. And but they, uh, but they had to actually learn. Mm. They didn't. They're not omniscient, right? But they do know a lot, or omnipresent. And they're no, definitely not. They're not. They can't they, read but your they mind. They do know a lot. They can travel to different places. Maybe I don't know. But anyway, so so yeah, that's how travel. I explain a lot of the normal hauntings that are bad. Is well, it's the disembodied spirit of the Nephilim. They're tricking the person. The trick has varying degrees of malice and effectiveness. And, and real quick, in terms of omniscient, the, uh, omniscience, they are not omniscient. God alone uh, bears right. these kinds of incommunicable attributes of omniscience, omnipresence. Um, but that again is not to downplay the situation. So imagine right. they're very like, like think of a TV show um, that's like like think of like a Sherlock Holmes. You know, like um, he can't read your mind. He's no. just a man. But he can pick it's, up on yeah. every well, mentalism. tiny little cue. Yeah. Um, imagine the best negotiator, the best uh, FBI. You know, well, in, have you heard of mentalism? Who's not wicked. You know, right. So you can't find one. Or even but, think about you know, an L. Ronder Gandalf type. Right. Person, and and they, then take that guy though and say he's been um, he's been a professional detective with a high IQ and he's been doing it for six thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> if you can teach people this cold reading, a lot of charlatans use exactly. cold reading. And you think they look they, at your reactions, right. mentalism. Even just the idea, though, that some of the, again, if you're tricking someone and you're really smart and you've lived 300 lives of men, then you are going to be able to also present the weakness of, look how silly I am. Mm -hmm. Look how wrong I was. Another point, though, that's important on this point is that we have biblical data for this. Yeah. In, in the form especially of, of the, the prophet, the foreteller, the fortune teller in the book of Acts, where this young lady has a spirit in her right. that is allowing her to do divination and foretelling the future. And she's walking around. Paul gets so annoyed that he ends up casting the demon out. And we know that it was a real ability, not only because the scriptures just presented as that, but also because now her owners, her masters lose a bunch of income. Yeah, right. Because it was Very profitable. Mad. Right, because if right. it was just a trick that the slave girl herself was performing, mm -hmm. then there, then she could just- She would just be able to keep doing it. Right, yeah. Paul casts out a demon, but there is no demon. She just keeps up the 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 grift. But we but, see this- But she can't. There actually is supernatural aid, and now it's gone. And we see this in other accounts. The Bell Witch is another example where the entity will seem to know things that are happening far far away. And in this time, before telegraph and telephone and texting and email, that was a big deal, insane thing. If they could know, you'd have to literally write a letter and ask someone what was happening at this time in this place, this forty miles away, right. and they'd be like, "Lo and behold, the the entity knew and was right, correct, right. and not because." So just like the om omniscience, not omniscient, can't read your no, thoughts, no. but incredibly, but crappy, we don't know how long up, it takes a demon to go pick up forty miles exactly. <laughs> and so then, with omnipresence, they're not omni. God alone is omnipresent, but um, 
demonic spirits, they, they are spirit. And so you think like, oh, well, it's just, it's everywhere. No, no, uh, the spirit still has a geographic locale. Yeah. Um, but could it travel in Very uh, fast. 60 seconds, yeah. 40 miles away and then right back? Or have or a maybe, messenger. We, we don't maybe know. Maybe there's portals. Work together yeah. with a network right. of... Real quick, before we continue with the show, you need to be aware that you're merely watching one episode of what's actually a 10-part series covering all things under the banner of high strangeness. The 10 episodes include the following. Number one, the lost city of Atlantis has just recently been discovered. Episode number two, Hollow Earth, The Last Living Dragons, and Primary Water. Episode number three, Biblical Giants, Their Clans, Sizes, and Supernatural Abilities. Episode number four, Mythological Giants, Hercules was actually a Nephilim. Episode number five, Everyone has been wrong about Bigfoot. Episode number six, fairies, the elemental spirits. Episode number seven, the biblical case for the existence of mermaids. Episode number eight, ghost. That's not your grandma. That's a demon. Episode number nine, witches, necromancy, and familiar spirits. And lastly, episode 10, angels, their classifications, physicality, and sexes. Now, all 10 of these episodes are available ad free right now exclusively on Patreon. These episodes are only dropping one at a time over a series of multiple weeks, but you can get them all available today ad free, plus the addition of two exclusive bonus episodes at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. Again, it's exclusively found at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. Go and check them out today. And now back to our program. Yep. You were going to say though, your second. Yeah, theory. my second. Let's and, hear your second. This is one that I hold. I don't even hold it. It's so loose. I'm so nervous. Okay. Right no, you've heard it. <laughs> okay. No, you've heard it actually. I, I don't really like it, but I'm just trying to conceptualize a way in which you actually could have what you think to be a ghastly encounter that's positive. So that sounds bad. That sounds like it's not allowed, but let's give it a shot. So there are two primary views of the creation of the soul. There's creationism Traducianism. and traducianism. Creationism says that at every conception of a human being, when, when conception is achieved, a soul is made. It's right. uniquely made by God right there. The other view, traducianism, says that, you, uh, and that the soul is generated as a part of conception. That you actually receive your soul from normal generation from your parents. God doesn't have to do anything. That there's not a uniquely new creation. Um, but you, you don't necessarily inherit the soul, but it's, it's more akin to that idea. And the explanation- so one, one basically is just saying, uh, the, the timing is still the same, but one, yes, the soul the comes from the parents, the, the other, it comes from God. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. And the, the explanation that's been given in defense of traducianism, which was a view held by Martin Luther, Augustine Waffled, Calvin Waffled, they both kind of landed on creationism later in life, but mm -hmm. they also didn't think about it all that much because- you shouldn't. We don't have a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, it's a gray area. And yeah. the Bible seems to speak in both ways at different times. But one of the defenses that's been given for traducianism mm -hmm. is a scenario like this. So you're at a family party, you're an old man and you have your grandkids sitting there in front of you. And, you're, and your grandkid walks just like your brother, mm. but they never met. But he, I mean, the same gait, the same exact way of sitting in a chair they have the same mannerisms, but they never met. Mm. Traducianism would say, well, maybe one way to explain that is that, the, is that they, the, the soul was generated from the parents and so they inherited a sort of like a piece of their, grand, or of their great uncle's mannerisms in a way. That's, that's kind of the defense. So my idea is what if, <laughs> this is gonna sound crazy really now, but what if uh, when you have a, a, a uniquely positive experience that you can't explain other than, well, I saw the ghost of my grandfather. What if it's not the ghost of your grandfather? What if it's just some sort of memory that you have that's been passed down through your lineage that you're now getting to share in that's sweet, that's good, that's, that's something positive? What if, it's, um, what if it's some sort of soul type memory? 
or something like that. Traducianism would allow for that category. Okay. How does the mechanics of this work, though? Because we're talking about apparitions. Yeah, I, I know. see my grandfather. Are you saying there's right, no, so some I'm not, sort of I'm not talking soul so much, vision that it wasn't really there, but it was kind of like an inherited no, memory? So or, I'm not talking so much of necessarily about seeing. Okay. Although that I think that could be possible mm-hmm. is your mind has this memory. Your soul and body are intimately connected at every at every point. That you think you see it. You're right. If you pull on the thread of, of the body, you're pulling on the thread of the soul as well. They're a tapestry that's woven together. And so maybe y- y- your your mind is remembering something that your soul carries with it. I I don't know. It, like I said, I don't even hold this. It's just an attempt. But another one that that I think is helpful, and this is actually a real story, is uh, someone wrote to me and they were saying that their father used to always wake them up when they were little kids, like babies oh. and toddlers, by squeezing their toes. Uh-huh, yeah. They squeezed their toes and that's how they woke them up. I heard this one. And the father passed away. And, and this is sort of a crisis separation thing too. And, and the day that the father passed away, the daughter woke up feeling like someone was pinching her toes. Right. In the same way that the father used to do. And she woke up and it was this really sweet memory actually. She was like, oh, wow. You, right. It did. wasn't a, a horror. It wasn't a horror thing. And so at the funeral service, she finds her brother and says, like, you'll never believe this, but the weirdest thing, like my foot fell asleep and it felt just like, and he was like, no, I had the same thing. Wow. The same morning that the father passed away, they didn't know that he was gone. And there was some sort of, and so it, it just makes you wonder. It makes you sit back and think, I don't know. Yes, there could be trickery there where they were already Christians, first of all. But there could be trickery there where they're trying to make them think that death isn't what it seems and right. and actually the Bible's not right and the soul lingers and it doesn't just go away immediately. But it could also be like, what if it was just a gift? What if it was a divine grace that they had this sweet memory of their father um, and and it actually played out for them and physically manifested? In yeah, I feel like, I think that's fair. I think there's multiple scenarios and I'll say them super quick, but one is it, it could be the trickster thing that even though they are Christians, yeah, it could um, be that it could still be well, a demonic spirit trying to trick them, giving them a a bad theology that the soul lingers because the Bible says to be absent in the body. There, there's not yeah, a yeah, lingering moment. There's not a hangover. That's it's where I get. It Lord. is not the. I soul get the of most the right, most exactly. trepidation because. I've heard stories like this from Christians. I've heard far more of them from right. non-Christians yes. yeah, agree. to right. whom it has given false comfort right. that death is not an enemy. Look, right. look, my, my buddy, he showed up to the, to the, the barbershop afterward and like look, I, yep. he, he was, he was already, I knew he was already dead at that point. And so, so to me, it's very, very dangerous yes. to entertain the idea of post-death appearances of family members, even as a comfort, Right, because of how often that has been used. Like, yeah, as, so, so I can't one, emphasize enough. The I don't thing, think that. Yeah, it's no, 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 no. Yeah. We hear, we hear. Of, I, I don't yeah. think it's any of. We that. hear, but what I was going to say is, so, mm-hmm. so one, I think I would lean pretty heavy on the trickery mm-hmm. um, scenario because, um, because you're right, and I like what you said. Death as an enemy. Uh, we, we, you know, a lot of times, well-meaning people, spiritual people, and even Christian evangelical people, you know, uh, this isn't. You know, we're not mourning a funeral. This is a celebration of life, and 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 they'll even use phrases like death as a door, and uh, that really, actually, um, when you when you stop and think about it. Uh, death becomes a savior. That this yeah. life, this yeah. world, uh, this body, this flesh. That that's that's the enemy. Um, and yes, my body is subject to decay, right? There's sickness and disease, and and within the members of my being, my flesh. Romans chapter seven. Uh, I find this law at work when I want to do good. Evil is right there. So there's a sense of of um, battling against the flesh and its sinful uh, propensity. So not only it's it's physical limitations and weakness and subject to decay, but also it's sinful uh, desires. And then this world is absolutely fallen and these kinds of things. And I think certain creatures, Jonathan Edwards would say this. I think yeah. you guys agree. Some creatures are more fallen than others. Yeah, like, totally per- agree. Particularly uh, evil and yeah. And nefarious. Golden lab labs are not as fallen as, as great white bulls. sharks and yeah, as pit bulls. Right. That's right. <laughs> Great point, pitbulls. Pitbulls I think are horrible. Should and, be eradicated. And I think <laughs> ar- arguably also uh, dragons, which yeah, yeah. are real. <clears throat> and it's not. It, you don't have to necessarily say that every dragon, although perhaps some, uh, but you don't have to say every dragon is actually the form of uh, a fallen angel like mm-hmm, Lucifer. Mm-hmm. You could also say no. Some dragons are animals, but in the fall, though that uh, particular animal, a dragon. Um, is particularly cursed. Yeah. It becomes yeah, particularly yeah, yeah. wicked, like a great white shark, and and I would say far far worse. And so, but all that being said, and I think dragons may still exist today. And so we can Let, talk let's about be that. Let's be honest. Power. That's I almost put that at sure. like a ninety five percent. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So almost for I'm sure. Right, right up that. there. The gospel of Jesus Christ, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That's a hundred percent. 
Dragons, we're going to put it at a solid 93, 94. That's I mean, yeah. I mean <laughs> wow. It's a close second. <laughs> but, then, but then what's really important is, but in between there, Primary water. Primary water. Primary that's a, that's, water, a, that's yeah. a 98%, 99%. And we're not joking. That is yeah. like, primary water is a thing. It's, we can't help but laugh. Let's, but, let's be, but let's be clear. Serious. We're talking about certainty, not importance. Right. Right. So, right. So, <laughs> yeah. Not importance, but Just so certainty. no one clips this out. Exactly. And they're like, yeah. Joel Webin believes that primary <laughs> water is almost as important as the no, gospel no, no, no. of yeah. Jesus not Christ. Not importance, but no. certainty. Like I'm right. certain that my wife's name is Megan. The right. same certainty yeah. of salvation by right. grace. But but one is more important than the other. One is one is. So of much greater for the record, this is the yeah. gospel one. That anyway, one. Uh, so all that means here's the deal. So it could be trickery, um, absolutely, to get people not to be afraid of death. Because here's the here's the thing: in God's mercy, the judgment of death. So one, death is not a door. Death is not your friend. Death is not the savior. That's what I was getting at. The body being sinful and the body subject to physical decay and weakness. Um, it, people, Christians, will even pick up on this language that uh, the body and the physical world, that's the enemy and death is the savior. Yeah. Yeah. Death becomes the savior. Save yes. me death from this. And that's what cult leaders people will pick up on. People forget that like, we were Drink not made. Drink the Kool-Aid and be done yeah. with yeah. this sad- We were made to be disembodied. We that's weren't right. made to leave the world. That's no, right. made to stay here for and, forever. And none of this is contrary to the very real doctrine, Romans 8, that death is an enemy that God has enslaved to serve his people's exactly. good. Exactly, and, that, and that's my point. So one, that's a different it's, thing. it's an enemy. Um, it will be defeated. It'll be the last of Jesus' yep. um, enemies to be defeated upon his final physical return. Also, uh, Jesus, when he's weeping, right? That Jesus wept at, at the, uh, the, the graveside of Lazarus, shortest verse in the New Testament. Um, if you, it, it also it doesn't just say he wept. So there is a grief for his friend and these kinds of things. Uh, Jesus is sympathetic um, to, to loved ones dying. Uh, but there's more than just that. There's also in the same text where it says that he was greatly troubled in spirit. And if you look into what that, he was angry. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a few reasons why. One, he's angry at the unbelief of all the people there because mm -hmm. he's the resurrection and the life. And they're all grieving, not just grieving the loss of a friend, uh, but they're grieving as though the resurrection power to raise Lazarus from the dead is not present. And it is. It's literally Jesus, present. It's right yeah, there, it's right standing there. <laughs> right next to you. Um, so you're grieving um, with uh, despair, unbelief. Believe, believe. Right. Uh, so I think he's angry at their unbelief, but also I think he's angry at his old enemy. At death. That he one day will, yeah. will give the death blow to death and lay death in its grave, but has not yet done that. Yeah, he's a jealous God. And yeah, and, and so yeah, I and think he's looking at death and say, I know you, you, should, you yeah. brute. You should you fear viper. God. Yeah. yeah. It, like the one of the most ancient hymns of the faith it includes the line that Christ trampled down death by death. Yeah. Amen. He hated it. He hates, he hates it. it. And so all that being said, any experience that would cause you to think death is less of an enemy mm -hmm and less formal, because all that, so one, we've established death is an enemy of Christ. But secondly, death is it's not, not the door, not your friend, not the savior, but death is, although an enemy, in God's divine and, and manifold providence, death, it, although God's enemy, it is also God's tool. And one of the premier tools that drives mortal creatures towards a need for a savior. If it weren't for for my awareness, right? Other animals don't have um, a, co a cognitive uh, awareness of their mortality, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we do. Right. Memento mori, right? Like a skull on the desk. I'm writing, I'm working, I'm doing these things, but I'm constantly reminded. And there's even, there's a, 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 a degree of that that's morbid and unhelpful, but there's a, gr a degree of that that is uh, very helpful. Right. That it's, uh, death is this constant awareness that is driving me towards, I mean, there, there are multiple days that I will spend time in prayer because one of the things that gets me there is love for Christ, you betcha. Uh, the power of the spirit, you betcha. Uh, but also uh, just, just the reminder that um that my life is a vapor. Yeah. One day I'm going to be uh, lower down six feet under dirt and I'm going to have to stand yeah. before the living God who will lay every thought bare. Yeah. Um, I can't escape death. Yes. And because I can't escape death tomorrow, I better run to Christ yeah. today. Yeah. So anything that makes death seem trivial or trite or happy or yeah. light uh, actually takes away one of the, the big incentives and driving forces yep. to push people towards the gospel. This is a big, and that is something that a, a malevolent spirit does. Yeah, absolutely. Not a and benevolent. they do it by putting on a face of softness yeah. right, and light and kindness. That's a big right. thing with the crisis apparition. Exactly. Is, is that yeah. it, it makes non-believers feel like they should be comforted. Yeah. In worst cases, you know, we heard one about a guy who committed suicide. 
mm-hmm. and his apparition appeared to his friend. And he was dead. And she so. and he was so happy. He was so happy to her. Right. He, he was like, Yeah, I just feel great. Like I love you so much. This is the barbershop one? Yes. I and, yeah. and, so that. That the, and so this woman is like, Wow, bad. I'm, I'm glad he I'm glad he murdered himself. <laughs> oh, I'm so you glad know? about that. Yeah, I'm so happy. Because he's and happier that's, now. And that's, he was yeah, always exactly. a little he was, bit he off. Off. his body. No, that's chemical imbalance in his brain. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And when you die, you fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah. And so we should, our prayer should be, teach us to number our days. Right. And you we should hate death like God hates death. When you're going to a funeral, you should be sad. Yeah. It's not, yeah, a, celebra- it's not yeah. a celebration of life. It's a mourning of death. And it's even okay appropriately to be a little angry. Yeah. It's a celebration of, if it's a celebration of anything, it's a celebration of those who can mourn as those with hope because of Christ's victory over death. Right. But even then, that, it's, it, it, even then, it's in the face of the state. We right. don't mourn as those without hope, but we mourn. Right. You're, you're not actually celebrating. You're that's still right. mourning. The distinction yeah. between the Christian and the Well, I think we can say we're celebrating that, the victory of Christ over yeah, you, That is the hope. We mourn right. as those the, with like, hope. I'm glad I am gospel, celebrating the resurrection. I'm glad that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. But, but right not now, celebrating death. We're not celebrating the resurrection yet because it hasn't yeah. happened. But right we, that is the hope. Right, yeah, the hope the is hope, a celebration of the surety that Christ right. has done that. I'm comfortable calling that a celebration. What all of the, 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 the ghosty kind of stories do though, is they try to get you to celebrate that the immortality of your own spirit, the escaping from the tether that's been weighing you down in life. You see this with, it's the same thing that happens and once with you die, you're not accountable. reincarnation mm-hmm. narratives are the same. Yeah. Oh, you go to a medium, a lot of the things they'll tell you is, oh, wow, you know, you and your best friend, you guys knew each other in a past life. And you guys, you know, we had neighboring farms or, you know, you and your wife, you've been married 16 times so far. And you're just, you're going to reincarnate. Just do try to build up your karmic uh, bank account so that you'll be reincarnated to a higher. It's all the same play. It just has a different face. Mm. Yeah, it's the same exact play, and that's yeah. what makes me. That's why again, haunted cosmos. That's why we so often say it was the demons. It was the mm. demons because a lot of the time it a is the times, demons, yeah. and they're smart enough to come up with different plays. And when we say demons, just we, and we talked about this in an episode we did on angels. But when when we say demons, um, I think that is a good way of understanding it, the Michael Heiser type of that. that um, there are fallen angels. But then there are also demonic spirits that that are are not necessarily an angel fallen from heaven, but the disembodied spirits of the nephilim. Yeah, uh, of the that, offspring that, of the that angel. have nowhere to go, neither above uh, nor beneath. For now, the yeah. unclean spirit bound to the earth in this age. And I think angel. we'll probably talk about this in our fairies episode. That there's also other categories of at least potentially, uh, potentially of spiritual fallen beings. Like this is this is one of those things that's speculative and mm-hmm. we don't know for certain, but but what whether it's one class of being or there are multiple classes of fallen being, they're certainly going to try if they're gonna to try to do anything, other than the, just their sheer hatred of the image of God. Yeah. Right. They are going to try to deceive you. Yeah. Yep. And they're going to do so in the way Paul warned as angels of light. Right. Through just as often as they're going to use horror and death and carnage. We see it in the transgender phenomena as well, that often they will convince human beings to believe that that black is white, white is black, that death is a friend, that, that true life is actually the enemy, that it, they'll try to convince you of the opposite of everything good. Right. And even, you know, the series you did with, with Isker and, and A.D. Robles, and you guys are talking about Trash World. Mm. The same thing that gives the hauntings in all of this supernaturalist stuff, it's the same... Yeah. Class of being in, in league with human sin, not to downplay human sin right. and sinfulness that makes trash world. Yeah. Right. It's all different fingers of the same yeah, black people, hand. But it's evil people who are being assisted. Oh, yeah. The, the catalyst in the equation, the evil people is the control, but the catalyst in this equation is, and again, the emphasis on ancient. These are, are thousands of years old, these spirits. They're not omniscient. They're not, they're not equals with God, not even close. They're not omniscient. They're not omnipresent. But they're 6,000. I mean, they're old. They're they learned. know things. They're learned. <laughs> yeah. They know what works. And they can give um, technology and, and techniques and skill and knowledge and all the and ancient knowledge and things uh, to those who are willing to make a and deal. They have the Bible memorized in Latin, Greek, English, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, they, these these are beings that they can spin words. They are powerful. They can spin ideologies. This is, again, we've talked about this verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. It's why it's important for the Christian to understand that they don't wage war with flesh and blood, but with the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. But we have spiritual power to tear down every stronghold. And it's important that this is connected and lofty opinion raised right. against the knowledge mm-hmm. of God. Ideologies. So the spiritual strongholds are wedded to ideologies. Yeah, that's right. Words are their most important weapon. Right. Beliefs are their most important weapon. Right. So they'll show you what they need to, to get you to cling on to a demonic belief or an ungodly belief. Because right. that's what will sink your ship at the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's what you believe to be true. Right. Your praxis will follow your belief. Yes. Right. What you do will follow what you believe. Yeah. Fantastic episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joel. There you have it. Ghosts. They're demons. (laughs) (laughs) Tune in next time. Real quick, right here at the end, I just wanted to remind you to become a member at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. Exclusively for our Patreon members, we have all 10 episodes, early access, ad free. Some of my favorite episodes to be looking forward to is episodes that deal with Bigfoot or fairies or ghosts or angels or giants, or particularly our episode on witches. If you want to watch these episodes now and you want to watch them without any ads, then you've got to join us by becoming a member at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries.